Did Louis B. Mayer really hate John Gilbert? It sure seems that way. Did they come to blows in fistfights? Well, possibly. Was he secretly waging a vendetta war against John Gilbert? I'm not entirely sure, and here's why. Let's break it down, piece by piece. John Gilbert was sacrificed by Hollywood. In a minute, his career and, well, his life were brutally wrecked. The money-making machine that had brought in millions was tossed away by Hollywood, like a used tissue. Hollywood, as I shared in my Hollywood Fixers video, had no qualms about crossing boundaries, whether they were moral or bureaucratic. They'd go to great lengths for the sake of money and control. He had to grapple with the harsh realities of life when the studio announced, this is the end, and forced him into retirement. John Gilbert, well, he became the emblem for this ruthless system. The studio's treatment of him was nothing short of harsh. One day he was a star, and the next, poof, Hollywood erased him. It's like they gave with one hand and then snatched it all away. He was the brightest star at MGM Studios, the ultimate leading man, the screen's most beloved lover. John Gilbert was a true household name in the silent movie era. It all began in 1924, when he hit the zenith of his career at just 28. But then, by 1930, his stardom had vanished. The burning question is, what the heck went wrong? Get ready to uncover the real reasons behind John Gilbert's tragic downfall. In this video I will show you how Louis B. Mayer crushed John Gilbert's career, uncovering their legendary clashes. And as a bonus, I'll share how John Gilbert's high-profile romances with Greta Garbo wreaked havoc on his career. But saving the juiciest for last, you'll hear about the massive scandal that marked his tragic end. I can guarantee that after watching this video you'll have a clear picture of how Hollywood dismantled John Gilbert. Let's be honest, John Gilbert's life is shrouded in myth. But how much of it is actually true? Well, in this video I'm going to strip away all the smoke, giving you a crystal clear look at the real John Gilbert. He wasn't just the great lover, but also Hollywood's unhappiest man all thanks to his rocky relationship with the powers that be in Tinseltown. With a meteoric rise, glamorous women demanding bosses and a penchant for alcohol, it's no wonder his story ends in tragedy. To get the full picture, you've got to understand something significant about Gilbert. He had a rotten childhood. His parents didn't exactly roll out the welcome mat for him. Born John Cecil Pringle on July 10, 1897, he had the misfortune of coming into this world to a mother who was a stage actress and a father who managed a stock company. John's mother, known as Ida Adair on stage, was quite young, and her first love was the theatre. His father was absent while his mother confessed she never even wanted him. Their divorce when he was young only added to his troubles. John was constantly on the move, rarely had friends his own age, and seldom saw the inside of a school. His mother paid little attention to him, even locking him in closets for hours at times. Things did take a turn for the better when his mother married a man named Walter Gilbert. Walter made an effort to be a father to John. He was finally sent off to military school where he could get an education, make friends, and even discover some talent in tennis and golf. But then it took a dark turn. At just fourteen, John's mother passed away, leaving him more alone than ever. Here's the first domino that set off the avalanche. His turbulent and possibly abusive upbringing left him with nothing but anger and resentment towards his mother. This disdain for his mother would become one of the reasons behind his clashes with MGM. Hungry and already strikingly good-looking, John Pringle transformed himself into Jack Gilbert, and headed to Hollywood in search of his fortune. What he found was far from glamorous. He had taken on bit roles to make it in the tough world of Hollywood, and it worked. He had caught the eye of the big shots over at Fox. They had signed him to a contract. They had started hyping him up as the next leading man. He had impressed both critics and moviegoers. Life should have been good, right? But there was a twist. Jack had loathed Fox. 
he had struck up a close friendship with Irving Thalberg, the young genius over at MGM. Irving couldn't stop singing John's praises to Louis B. Mayer, predicting that he would be the next big thing. So MGM had jumped in and had signed him to a contract. Everyone was supposed to be happy now. Or were they? Well, John had been content. He had liked MGM, but for some strange reason, Louis B. Mayer had appeared to have an issue with him. It was a head-scratcher because John had been a likeable, nice and thoughtful guy. But Louis B. Mayer had been a bit of an old mama's boy. He had adored his mother and had believed that all mothers should be put on pedestals and worshipped. Now we all knew how Gilbert felt about his mother. It was possible that John, being the mischievous type, enjoyed getting a rise out of Louis B. Mayer. It was said that at some point, early on at MGM, he had said something rather nasty about his own mother to Louis B. Mayer. Well, that didn't go down well. In fact, it had gotten Louis B. Mayer so riled up that he actually decked John. Yeah, punched him. Now, this hadn't been the first time Louis B. Mayer decided to throw a punch at actors, and it hadn't been the last all because John hadn't had the same adoration for his mother as he did. The big boss had hated him, and he had held on to that grudge for many, many years. But did Mayer go so far as to wreck John Gilbert's career, and did these two have yet another showdown? Well, those are questions I am about to dive into. But before we get into it, let's clean the slate a bit. I have a feeling some of you might not like where this is heading— I mean, who doesn't love a good old romantic story between two stunning people, right? Well, brace yourselves, because we might burst that bubble. I promise to reveal all the juicy details of the most sensational romantic affair of the century, and the scandal that surrounded it. I know this is the part you've all been itching for, the media they hyped up John Gilbert and Greta Garbo like there was no tomorrow, turning it into this legendary tale. What's the real deal here? John and Greta bumped into each other while filming Flesh and the Devil, though they'd seen each other around the studio lot before, and trust me, Greta couldn't have missed John. He was the big shot at MGM. She had even caught some of his flicks, especially the big parade, and it's safe to say she had a little crush on him, like a ton of other ladies. Now, here's a quick side note. This was right around the time when Rudolf Valentino kicked the bucket at a shockingly young age. This sent women on the hunt for the next great lover, and guess who fitted the bill perfectly? None other than our man John Gilbert. So it was only natural that he inherited that title along with a legion of smitten fans. You know, John had a knack for getting himself entangled in what we might call love with his female co-stars, although personally I'd lean towards calling it infatuation. Perhaps it was a case of his on-screen roles blurring with his off-screen life. It's like he couldn't quite separate himself from the characters he portrayed on the silver screen. You could even say John had a touch of the method actor in him. Gilbert should have seen the train wreck coming in his life with Garbo. The studio bosses were thrilled about their budding romance. You know very well that kind of publicity is priceless. Audiences swarmed to witness the real-life love story of their favourite Hollywood stars. But behind the scenes, things weren't what they seemed. John was incredibly supportive of Greta. She was shy and reclusive, often struggling with the presence of an entire crew watching her every move. John went to great lengths to put her at ease, and in many ways he played a pivotal role in her rise to stardom. Being linked with one of Hollywood's biggest stars didn't hurt her career. Before Hollywood, Garbo starred in German films and was more accustomed to the acting style popular in Europe. When John worked with her, he noticed some of her quirks and set about helping her improve. Between takes, he'd offer her guidance away from the director's ears. It was quite a gesture, but it didn't stop there. His controlling tendencies did sometimes benefit Garbo. She was an introvert. She hated public appearances and refused autographs. These behaviours weren't conducive to a rising star's career, am I right? John, the smooth operator, taught her the art of socialising. In return, Garbo repaid him in a rather peculiar way. She allowed him to watch her film Intimate Love Scenes, 
Garbo had such trust in John that she asked him to direct the steamy love scenes in her movie The Masks of the Devil, even though it already had a director, Edmund Golding. It seemed like they were deeply in love, making many public appearances together, which was also excellent publicity for Greta. She moved into John's house, and their on-again, off-again romance persisted for several years. This was John's typical approach in most of his relationships. The chemistry between Gilbert and Garbo was electric, both on and off the screen. Before the three-week shoot of Flesh and the Devil was over, they were head over heels for each other, even discussing marriage. This would have been John's third marriage and Garbo's first. But their love story was destined for a heart-wrenching end. John was madly in love with Garbo, but the reclusive starlet was always hesitant to fully commit. Reportedly, John proposed to her many times, but she was always indecisive, but on one occasion John actually managed to set a wedding date. Let me tell you, it ended in disaster. There's a whirlwind of drama circling this wedding. That's almost surreal. Let's try to make some sense out of this bizarre situation. Two critical points are up for debate here. First, the rumour mill suggests that John and Greta had their own wedding plans, but Greta left John high and dry at the altar. Second, following Greta's heart-wrenching betrayal, John found himself in a heated showdown with his arch-enemy, Louis B. Mayer. Things got so intense that John ended up pushing Mayer to the ground, leading Mayer to scream that John was finished in Hollywood. This, some say, laid the groundwork for Louis B. Mayer to undermine John's career. On the morning of his wedding, Gilbert woke up feeling on top of the world, having finally convinced the Sphinx of Cinema to marry him, but by nightfall he was a wreck. Unfortunately, as Gilbert stood at the altar, eagerly awaiting Garbo's arrival, she left him standing there, a heartbroken groom with no bride in sight. Garbo was a clever woman, even if it was about men. She never lost her cool. It was her start. She had no intention of tying herself down to marriage. Now, here's my question to you. Was Greta truly in love with Gilbert, or was she just using him? I mean, let's face it, Greta Garbo wouldn't be the first, and certainly not the last woman to climb the ladder of fame on a man's back. I'm really intrigued to hear your thoughts on this, so go ahead and drop your comments below. Back to our lonely groom. Gilbert, often seen as a romantic playboy, didn't hold back his emotions. He couldn't help but break down in tears when he realised Garbo wasn't coming. The would-be ceremony turned into a scene right out of one of his dramatic films, and things were about to get even more intense. The infamous MGM studio head, Louis B. Mayer, was right there at the botched wedding, and he had no patience for his leading man's hysterics. As one witness puts it, Mayer strolled into the bathroom, spotted Gilbert huddled in a fetal position, and callously quipped, "'Sleep with her! Don't marry her!' This heartless remark sent Gilbert into a furious fit. He lashed out at Mayer, sending him crashing to the ground, with his head thudding against the floor. Mayer allegedly bellowed, "'You're finished, Gilbert! I will destroy you!' Now, when Louis B. Mayer issued threats, they weren't to be taken lightly. Gilbert had just marked himself as a target, and his inevitable downfall was just a matter of time. At the beginning of this video, I promised to uncover a truth that has remained hidden until now. Did Louis B. Mayer truly destroy Gilbert's career? Here's the real story. That dramatic incident at a star-studded celebrity wedding, contrary to popular belief, John Gilbert walked away from it unscathed. He wrapped up Flesh and the Devil and continued to shine as MGM's leading star. Following that, he delivered in well-received films like Man, Woman and Sin, Love. Once again with Garbo, with MGM smartly using their relationship for marketing and The Cossacks. Gilbert played leading roles in high-budget productions, collaborating with the era's top directors and receiving unwavering support from MGM. Moreover, it's essential to note that in 1926, talkies were still a few years away and weren't even on the horizon for anyone, including Louis B. Mayer. There was no covert scheme to derail John Gilbert's career with talkies due to a personal feud. 
Gilbert was a significant revenue source for MGM, and despite Mayer's personal sentiments, business thrived with him on board. Remember, in the studio, it's all about the money. It was the only thing that mattered. It was in the late 1920s, as films made the shift from silent to talkies, Gilbert and his fellow actors faced a tough challenge, how to stay in demand in this new era of sound. Gilbert sought advice from his directors. They suggested he adopt a precise stage diction, basically an exaggerated Shakespearean-style enunciation, rather than the more natural Brando-esque method acting. Spoiler alert, this advice turned out to be a disaster. It's a well-known story that spread like wildfire. Audiences actually laughed at John Gilbert. He took the advice on diction a bit too seriously. In the 1929 movie, His Glorious Night, there's this emotional scene where Gilbert passionately says, I love you, to his co-star, using his carefully articulated voice. The audience burst into laughter. This marked the beginning of Gilbert's decline, and it's possible that Louis B. Mayer had a hand in it. I've heard it a thousand times, the talk is ruined, John Gilbert and his voice was high-pitched and squeaky, and then there's the Mayer story we talked about earlier, suggesting John was done for at MGM. Well, it's time to debunk these myths once and for all. The truth is, there was never anything wrong with John's voice. People had some weird idea about how he should sound, and when talkies first came in, I think John was kind of unsure about how to use his voice. He went back to his stage training and tried to speak in his first talkie redemption, but it sounded unnatural. They actually shelved redemption because the sound quality was terrible. They didn't know what they were doing yet. Plus, his new wife, Ina Clare, was a seasoned stage actress, kept pushing him to speak all posh. Honestly, he probably should have just been himself and spoken the way John Gilbert normally did. It reminds me of something I read in Spencer Tracy's biography about a movie he did with Jean Harlow. She was new to Hollywood and was trying to talk the way the studio wanted, but Spencer told her not to bother with that and just use her natural voice. It turned out great for her. It's a shame Spencer couldn't have given John that advice before redemption. I know, I know, you might be wondering what on earth ruined John Gilbert if not the famous studio head and not the talkies. And as I mentioned, I've saved the best for last. This is the key to unlocking the entire mystery behind John Gilbert's story. So brace yourself, because I'm about to reveal the answer. Let's get back to Mare. In the late 1920s, a lot was going on that would spell disaster for John Gilbert. First, he got a pretty good offer from United Artists that could have been a game-changer for him, but around the same time Fox and MGM were planning to merge. They didn't want to lose their top star in the process, so they waived an even juicier deal in front of John. $250,000 per picture in a six-picture deal, which was a ton of money back then, along with a promise that Louis B. Mayer was on his way out. Now, this is where John made a career-destroying mistake. It wasn't the talkies, it wasn't Louis B. Mayer, and it wasn't his voice. It was him signing that contract with MGM, and I'll tell you why. John made a couple of films under the new contract, and everything was going well. Then several things happened in quick succession. 1. Talkies became the new way to make films. 2. The stock market crashed. 3. The merger fell through. Louis B. Mayer wasn't on his way out. The studio lost money due to the stock market crash and the failed merger. This financial instability put a target on John's back with his hefty contract. MGM realised they had to start making talkies, but they were a bit late to the party and lacked the expertise and top-notch equipment for quality sound. Besides, they had a star they needed to feature in a talkie, so they picked Redemption. It was an odd choice for a story, and even odder choice for a director. Lionel Barrymore had very little directing experience. Maybe they were trying to save money. The combination of John's unnatural voice, poor sound recording, and an inexperienced director made the film terrible. Why? 
They wanted to get rid of the John Gilbert contract. They didn't want to have to pay him $250,000 per picture. They wanted to make John ridiculous, hoping he'd leave the contract or do something that would void it. To make matters worse, they released this farce of a movie while John was on his honeymoon. When he returned, the movie was a failure. Now John Gilbert was fighting for his career, taking on increasingly bad films at MGM. John didn't help himself either. When things went south, he turned more to alcohol. This was not the best time to be married to John Gilbert. He was generally moody to begin with, so it's no surprise that after just six months of marriage, Ina Clare moved out. They ended up divorcing in 1931. There are even allegations that MGM tried to get Ina Clare to extract a large sum of money from John, hoping it would force him to give up his MGM contract. These bad movies had affected the public's perception of him, even though he achieved moderate success in some films weren't profitable. They were desperate to end that contract. MGM's aim was to lead John Gilbert to the guillotine and end the fading popularity of one of the silver screen's most beloved stars. They forced him into retirement. After being released from his MGM contract, John's situation caught the attention of Harry Cohn, head of Columbia Pictures. Cohn, who also loathed Louis B. Mayer, saw an opportunity to resurrect John's career and return him to his former box office glory. But he had one condition. John needed to stay out of trouble and away from the bottle as much as possible. But he cast John in a role that required him to play an alcoholic alongside heavy drinking co-stars. It was unrealistic to expect John to stay on the wagon in such an environment. Crew members on the film remember John being drunk most of the time and extremely ill when he wasn't. Unfortunately, the movie was another box office failure for John Gilbert, ending his career. After this, Gilbert became his own worst enemy. Alcoholism consumed every aspect of his life, and by then it was clear that no one could save him. His unhealthy lifestyle had finally caught up with him when he suffered a heart attack while swimming. So, that's the story. That's the truth. John Gilbert's life wasn't ruined by Louis B. Mayer or by the advent of talkies, but by himself and a series of unfortunate events. It would be unfair to pass judgment on when or how he was ruined, but I'd love to hear your opinion. People generally seem to regard him with fondness, perhaps mixed with a great deal of pity. My point, I suppose, is that we can safely say John Gilbert was a good person and quite well liked. In 1935, even at the age of 38, he was still very handsome and hadn't lost any of his legendary charm. I've always been intrigued by John Gilbert. He struck me as a dynamic actor with so much to offer, and I couldn't wrap my head around how the arrival of the sound era derailed his career. I'd seen him alongside Greta Garbo in Queen Christina, and couldn't figure out why people believed his voice wasn't suitable for sound. When I heard him speak, he didn't sound subpar at all. Unlike some silent stars who turned out to have heavy lower-class accents or those from other countries struggling with English, Gilbert, in my opinion, had a charming and well-spoken voice. John Gilbert's career took a tumble, but it wasn't as straightforward as pointing fingers— it was a wild mix of ambition, personal battles, and the ever-shifting sands of Tinseltown. But the real takeaway here is that life, much like the silver screen, is chock full of surprises. Behind the glitz and the gossip, there's a human story of triumph and tragedy. As you navigate your own path, remember this. Success and failure are never black and white. John Gilbert's tale is living proof of that. And now I want you to watch this video. Why Vivian Lee couldn't be satisfied in bed. <laughs> 